But a lot of these firms, a lot of the private equity firms, not all, but many, and a lot of the venture capital firms are too big. It's become an AUM game. So as a result of that, they're investing in investments that maybe because they've got so much money, they have to make investments, but they might not normally do it. So I'll give you a perfect example. I had a good friend who did a roll-up of logistics companies. He needed $150 million. Great track record. Placement agent in New York got him $500 million. He said, terrific, I just need $150, let's get started. Placement agent comes to his house in New York and writes down on paper, in a very condescending way, 2% of 500 million equals X, 2% of 150 equals Y, what am I missing? And so what my friend, who was a bit incredulous, said is, what you're missing is if I do what you want me to do, there won't be a fun too. For more ideas on how to raise venture capital in this market, make sure to subscribe below. Ron, welcome to the 10X Capital Podcast. Thank you to Cody Meltzer of Family Office World Media for connecting us. Welcome on. Glad to be here. Glad to have you. Ron, you have one of the most unique ways to access deal flow of anyone I've ever talked to. Tell me about how you've been able to get into the very top funds. What we do is we invest alongside about 100 single family offices. These are families anywhere between 250 million up to 30 billion. And we kind of act as a funnel or a point person. I'll put in a couple of million per deal. We don't charge anything, but I'm not doing it for self list purpose. I do it selfishly because without their 50 to 100 million dollars, I wouldn't be the first call. So what I do is I call it first call alpha. First call alpha. What do you mean by that? If there's an attractive deal or something, a very unique situation, usually the wealthiest person is called. I'm not that person. Now I am. What are the other variables that makes an LPL attractive outside of optimal wealth? The ability to add value. You don't want to just have people who have money. You want to have people who can strategically add value. If we're going to do a deal with in real estate, I might talk to Tim Callahan, who was Sam Zell's former partner. If we do a venture capital deal, I chaired the Disruptive Technology Center for the advisory board of Stanford University. I've got a whole plethora of professors at Stanford who are much smarter than me in venture. If it's private equity, I might go to a Paul Carbone from Pritzker Family Office and talk to him about it. Why would a $30 billion family office want to go invest with you? It's a great question. Deal flow. Basically, they're not looking at me for the, the vast majority or even the minority of their deals. But we may have a special situation if somebody's looking to sell a sports team. If there's a one-off deal, they like to see what it is. This is interesting. Let's dig in. So let's say somebody sends you a venture fund. Tell me about the process, how you get to deciding that you want to invest. Walk us through that. I surround myself with people that are smarter than me in various areas. So we only invest in the private markets. It's private equity, venture capital, real estate, and credit. I know you're an expert in venture capital. So for venture capital, I'll rely on the people at Stanford to kind of help me vet these deals. We typically don't like to invest in funds. We do invest in funds if we have to, in order to get the direct deals. But so what we typically do is we'll come in and let's say somebody's looking to raise a hundred million dollars. We might come in and say, we'll take the whole thing or we'll take $50 million. Because we do that, we're able to take part of the GP, get better economics for it. And I'm able to leverage the assets that we're using. So it's a win-win for the investors. And I benefit because I'm basically aggregating everything with the different investors. My friends say from a business standpoint, it's called stupid. But in short term, it is. It is myopic. But I I think that, you know, in medium term, maybe it makes sense. Everything I do, I look at how this is going to impact me in 10, 20 years, not two months or three months. So I I try to take a long term perspective. The returns actually, when there is a real alpha, do accrue to the LPs, not the GPs. What do you think about that? What you're saying is technically correct, but I do believe that a lot of these firms, a lot of the private equity firms, not all, but many, and a lot of the venture capital firms are too big. It's become an AUM game. So as a result of that, they're investing in investments that maybe because they've got so much money, they have to make investments, but they might not normally do it. So I'll give you a perfect example. I had a good friend who did a roll-up of logistics companies. He needed $150 million. Great track record. Placement agent in New York got him $500 million. He said, terrific. I just need $150. Let's get started. Placement agent comes to his house in New York and writes down on paper in a very condescending way, 2% of 500 million equals X, 2% of 150 equals Y, what am I missing? And so what my friend, who was a bit incredulous, said is, what you're missing is if I do what you want me to do, there won't be a fund too. Because I'm smart enough to know that I make more money. And I think that as private equity and venture capital have disrupted the public markets in the mid 80s, private equity will never replace, but is going to slowly disrupt private equity and venture capital because it's got patient capital. Family offices will essentially disrupt private equity. What do you mean by that? The private equity firm is incented to hold that for three to five years. They're not incented to hold it for 25 years. They're incented to hold it for three to five years. And so what happens in the market is they'll hold it for three to five years, hopefully make a profit, and then they'll sell it. But they'll sell it to a second private equity firm. So a smart private equity firm is selling. Another smart private equity firm is buying. And they'll sometimes sell it and they'll try to hold it for three to five years. And then they'll sell it perhaps to a third private equity firm. So over the course of a 20-year period, 
you could see one firm change hands four to five times. If you look at the friction, the taxes, and the disruption in business to do that versus a family office who will buy it, hold it for 20 years, compound everything, it's not even close. The problem is that there's very few family offices that can do this. Some can, and those that can, it is a better model, but only a very few can. And we're only in the second or third inning in the evolution of family offices. The counter argument to that has been private equity returns, though not venture capital, have sustained over many decades. Okay, so let me preface this by saying, private equity has been an incredibly lucrative asset class. I personally invest in a lot of private equity funds and direct deals. So I, I'm a believer in private equity. All that I'm saying is that what's happened is that many of these firms, not all, but many of them have bastardized the business and it has become an AUM game. And if you could be a $300 million fund or you could be a $3 billion fund, oftentimes many of the private equity firms opt for the larger one. If you're getting 2% of $3 billion every single year as an annuity, that's a lot of money. So there were several instances right before COVID happened where we were going to buy companies. I, put together a syndicate of 10, 20 families, and we loved the company and we were gonna pay X. And then a private equity firm came in and paid two X or three X. And why do they do that? Well, if they raise the money, they've got two options. They could deploy it or they could return it. They'll never return it, they'll always deploy it. So that forces them in certain markets to buy companies and overpay. Let's go to the crime scene. At some point in the last decade, venture has followed the private equity kind of asset amalgamation model. What was the driver behind that? SoftBank's a perfect example. You can't deploy that kind of capital in venture. Objectively, you can't. So they were way overpaying for companies because they had a certain amount of capital, they had to do it. And I think that in general, this has morphed more into an AUM model. And if you look at the people who run the private equity and venture capital firms, there are some phenomenal venture capital firms. And I know you do a phenomenal job with your companies. And there's some great private equity firms, but most, of the people on private equity and venture capital, not all, but most are finance guys. They're not operators. In order to create alpha, true alpha, you need to operate. I can strip a company and basically financially engineer a company and make a profit. That's not that hard. But to create true profit over the medium and long term, you need to operate. In terms of family offices, I think one of their biggest advantages, if not their biggest advantage, is their flexibility. What is the most sophisticated or most interesting structures that family offices could bring into the venture space? We're at a, an inflection point. So post-crash, pre-COVID, a lot of family offices did direct deals. And their thought process was as follows. I can make money. I don't have to pay fees. Why should I pay somebody like you or a 220 if I can make money? And during that period of time when interest rates were zero and during post-crash, pre-COVID, everything went up. Private equity, venture capital, real estate, credit, Bitcoin, the stock market, whatever you invest in. So many family offices went to the model, I'm just, why pay fees? And they were right until they were wrong. There's a skill set to doing what venture capitalists do, a huge skill set. And about 18 months ago, when they started raising interest rates, a lot of these family offices, not only were not making money, they're actually losing money. And if they did these direct deals, Carter did a study where some of these Series B investments were down 50%, Series C were down 75%. Venture is a great asset class if you do it full-time, and if you could pick the right top quartile or top decile. If you don't do this full-time, you should never do venture. You should just outsource it yourself. But a lot of families did, and there's a lot of pain right now. The fascinating thing about this world that I'm in, and it's changing in real time, is over the next 20 years, we're about to experience the largest transfer of wealth in history. There's $84.4 trillion that's moving downstream from the baby boomers to the next gen in the next 20 years. So it'll get bigger and bigger and bigger. And family offices right now, just to put it in perspective, hedge funds globally are 6.5 trillion. Family offices are 10 trillion. After the wealth transfer, family offices will be larger than private equity and venture capital combined. So it's a massive, massive market. And I think what's happening is you're seeing more and more people come in and wanting to start family offices. But if you do the math, a single family office, if you're gonna pay your own accountant, you're going to pay your own lawyer. You're going to pay your own admin. You're going to pay your own staff. You're going to pay your own executive assistant versus a multifamily office, which was created for people typically worth 10 million to 200 million, where you just share all of those costs. So what's happened is people have a liquidity event. They can sell their company for $30 million. It's a lot of money. And I make no judgment. It's just not enough money to have a family office. I would also argue today that 80, 85% of the family offices that exist should not exist the way they do. Only 25% of families make it to the second generation. 
and 10 make it to the third and five make it to the fourth. So we have to fix that. What does a minimum viable family office have in terms of staff and resources? Great question. And it completely depends. So there are some families that like to invest primarily in public markets. They don't need the bandwidth. They don't need the staff. They don't need the people to vet the venture private equity direct deals. There are some families that the founder made their money in tech. They love venture. They love private equity. They like to do direct deals. They're going to need a much bigger staff. You know, one exception is we've done a lot of work with the Pritzkers, with in Paul Carbone from the Pritzker family office. They've got a team of 65 people who work under him. They've institutionalized it. They've got a large asset base. You don't need that much. But what happens is so often I see a company, somebody, they sell their company for half a billion or a billion dollars. And they'll call me up and they'll say, Ronnie, I'm looking to hire my son-in-law, straight A student from Indiana University. And I'm looking to hire him and say, what do you think? I'm like, well, what, what's he done afterwards? I'm like, no, no, he just graduated. I'm like, well, I think it's stupid. So right now, a family office, if they're going to hire a kid out of Stanford or Wharton, and they pay him $250,000, typically, they look at that as a cost. In other words, I sold my company. I'm going to pay you, you're a smart kid, $250,000. It costs me. If Blackstone or Carlisle or KKR hire somebody at $250,000, they look at that kid as a potential $20 million profit center. So it's nuanced. It's not a cost. It's a potential profit center. So family offices are not grasping that. Uh, you did, did a pretty gritty thing. You created an entire conference. You said the conference that you wish existed. Tell me about that. I keynote a lot of family office conferences. I was chairing the Disruptive Technology Center, the advisory board of Stanford University. A lot of the families that I invest with, they say, which conference should I go to? And my answer is none. You know, there's a couple that I think are pretty good. But in general, I wouldn't go. And the problem is they're pay to play. So if you're speaking... You might be smart, you might be an idiot, but I know you spent 25 grand to speak and that's not why I should be listening to you. So what's happened to the conferences in general is it's a pay to play model, it's service providers pitching to other service providers. When I was at Stanford, I said, let's put together a family office conference that I would go to. So I went to Kirkland Ellis and I went to EY and I said, look, I don't want to run a conference. I don't have the skill set to do that. What I want to do, you guys back it, but what I want to do is I'll pick the speakers and I'll pick the content. And you guys do everything else. So what I was trying to create is a conference that I would tell people, you should absolutely go to this conference. And that I would say, I would love to go to. So a couple examples. We had Paul Carbone um, from the Pritzker family office, who's a good friend, was speaking on due diligence. He wasn't pitching a fund. He was just saying, this is how I diligence deals. Tim Callahan, who was worked with Sam Zell, this was during COVID. He wasn't trying to raise money for a fund two or fund three. He was just talking about where he thinks office market's going to be in the next three to five years because it was during COVID. We'll continue our interview in a moment after a word from our sponsor. Most businesses use up to 16 tools to hire, manage, and pay their workforce. But there's one platform that's replaced them all. That's Deal, D-E-E-L. Deal is the all-in-one HR and payroll platform built for global work. The smartest startups in my portfolio use Deal to integrate HR, payroll, compliance, and everything else in a single product. Focus on what you do best, scale your business, and let Deal do the rest. Deal allows you to hire, onboard, and pay talent in over 150 countries, from background checks to built-in contracts. You can manage the entire worker lifecycle from a single and easy-to-use interface. Click the link in the show notes below to book a free, no-strings-attached demo with Deal today. And then lastly, we had Denise Illich, who was another speaker, who helped to rebuild Detroit. She was from Little Caesars. She wasn't saying donate to my philanthropy. She's just saying, if you're going to be philanthropic and charitable, here's how you might want to think about it. So everything was educational. We had 880 families from six continents. There's a huge demand for content, and that didn't exist. We're going to be announcing it shortly, but there's another university, one of the top ones in the world, that we're creating a family office initiative to. It'll be, it'll be out in public in the next 60 days. But that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to create. So when it comes to Paul, Tim, Denise, what is their motivation to speak on these topics? It's a great question. And it's not just them. I mean... Look, I was at a conference, at a family office conference. I was with a guy that I knew fairly well, and he was looking to raise money for a fund. But it was a venture fund. I see somebody else that I know, good guy, and I wanted to talk to somebody else. I'm like, oh, you, you, guys, you guys should talk. I thought they would like each other. They talk. The guy comes back to me in five minutes. He goes, why did you introduce me to them? He's like, I'm like, what are you talking about? He goes, he's not going to invest with me. And I'm like, well, I didn't really come to this conference for the sole purpose of trying to find people to invest money for you. So people look at it as they're always trying to take rather than give. And I think that a lot of times it's a myopic way to look at the world. And I think when I was younger, I probably would have looked at it more from that standpoint. But I think to answer your question is people want to give back. People want to help. I'll give you a perfect, another perfect example. I was at Northwestern University. I wanted to do an internship, which means I wasn't getting paid. And I called one of my dad's friends, cold called him and just said, I would be interested in doing an internship. 
I'm going to call him Mr. M. Mr. M made me feel like this tall. All I wanted to do is work for him and for no pay. And he made me feel like, how dare you have the audacity to call me? And I just said, I would never under any circumstance ever make anybody feel that way. So we all started somewhere. Nobody starts at the top and you just have to pay it forward. And I think a lot of people who do that, people like Tim Callahan, people like Denise Ellis, they give back, they're givers. And it's counterintuitive, but there's a book called The Go-Giver, which is one of my favorite books. The more you give, the more you get. It makes no logical sense, but it works. Tell me more. Let's say I'm going to go to lunch with you, and I think you have the ability to put in $5 million. I'm not going to really enjoy that lunch. My goal of that lunch is to basically close the deal and knowing what time I'm going to ask you for the $5 million to invest, right? So I'm looking at that from the standpoint of how much do I think you can afford to invest and when can I do it? I'm looking at it from a myopic standpoint. I think that if you if you come in with from the standpoint of educating and not everything has to be a sale, everything has to be a transaction, good things just happen. And the more stressed and pressured you feel, they could sense that too. And when I'm first starting out, I was I was that guy. And then when you become more successful, part of it, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy because you're less stressful. People could see that and it feeds, it's a loop. It's a paradox. I also have a lot of empathy. As, as I mentioned, I was first generation refugee. My family came over $600. So you grow up, you're, you're definitely hungry. So I have empathy for people at that stage of their life as well. I've been running my own social experiment really with this podcast started last July and every single LP that I know or even that I'm building a relationship with, I put on the podcast. And a lot of people think that's crazy. You're basically dilute, diluting your relationships, but I don't look at it. And, and the returns have been astronomical, both financially and relationship wise, but there's these kind of infinite games that you can play with infinite people which not only I think works out financially, it's also just a great way to live. My quality of life has significantly improved just being positively inclined towards people. My mentor, Eric Anderson, who I interviewed, calls it pronoia. What if you had a positive belief that people were good? I haven't had the luxury to do that till I was in my late 20s and I just recently started doing it to the extremes. Most people look at the world like there's a pie and they're gonna do everything they can to fight for their piece of the pie rather than just think about, have a growth mindset and think it, it could be exponential, it could grow. You need to live your life, in my opinion, with a growth mindset that there's enough for everybody and just create value, give back, do good and good things happen. Another pro tip, one of the top sales tips I could give anyone in any industry is become the customer. If you're raising from LPs, become an LP in a couple of funds, you'll know very quickly how you wanna be treated You'll know how you want to be sold. It's easier to have empathy with yourself than with any other person. So if you do want to become really good at selling anything, first become a customer of that thing. What would you like our listenership to know about you, about your family office, or anything else you'd like to shine a light on? Well, from the business perspective, which is the less important, I've got a newsletter. I've started a media company, with, with, which has a podcast and a newsletter, and we invest. We've got an, a good enough name in the, in the marketplace right now where you know I'm considered kind of a thought leader in the family office space. That's on the business. I think the, the main thing is, and I talk to entrepreneurs because I taught at Stanford, I taught in the, the entrepreneurship program, they want to get rich. And I'm not saying that when I was younger, that that's not what wasn't one of my goals. But if there were a direct correlation between wealth and happiness or success, however you define it, I'd say just try to get as rich as possible. But there's not. I know a lot of miserable billionaires. So my message basically is one of gratitude. Basically, gratitude to me is the most important thing I mean, behind love. You could tell me 10 things offline that really suck about your life. Maybe your mom's sick or maybe your cousin is sick. It could, it could be anything. We've all got stuff. I've got stuff. You know, you also were a refugee with $600 and you, you went from there to where you are now. You've got a ton to be grateful for. And I think the way humans are wired, we're not really good at the gratitude. So I think we have to focus more on that. Why are there so many miserable billionaires? I think that that's how they define it's a game. So there's always somebody richer than you, right? I knew a company, I, I, he sold his company for $3 billion. And there was another company guy who sold his company for like $10 billion. It wasn't that he was bitter. He just like, yeah, I should have done this. I should have done that. I could have been like that. If you judge everything by a dollar sign, it's a miserable way to live your life. I'll give you a quick anecdote. My daughter is... Five years old, she's 20 now, but she was five years old at the time. For her class, she had to do the five most important things. So for her, I worked on it with her. It was, you know, being a good listener, being a good sister, being smart, being nice, being popular. Those are things. Then as only a kid can do, she turned it on me. She goes, what are your five most important things in life? I'm like, well, I don't know. I'll get back to you. And then she kept asking me. She was like, I did it with, I did it. What's yours? And then like every week she would ask me. And so 
finally I, I needed to give her an answer and I came back and I said, all right, here's my five in order, love, gratitude, attitude, balance, and laughter. That's not right and it's not wrong. Those are my five most important things. Other people, religion would be in there. Other people, other things would be in there. But for me, love, gratitude, attitude, balance, and laughter, those are my five. And I think that we need to live our lives. You have to be true to yourself and find out who you are. And it, sometimes it takes 10 years, sometimes it takes 70 years, but you have to find out who you are, true to yourself and live like that. And if you follow your principles, I think you're gonna live a happier life. Well, that's a great place to leave it off. Thank you, Ron, for jumping on the podcast. I hope to meet up in Chicago or New York very soon. Thank you. By popular demand, the 10X Capital Podcast has officially launched our newsletter powered by Caria Labs, a full service content marketing firm that's partnering with us on the newsletter. In our weekly newsletter, we will keep you updated on all things emerging managers and limited partners, including industry trends that are critical to know as an LP, VC, or founder. To subscribe to our totally free newsletter, please visit 10xcapitalpodcast.com. Again, that's 10xcapitalpodcast.com. We thank you for your support.